Well, everybody, welcome to Red Tool House. Have you ever heard the phrase, dance with who brought you? Well, it's something I think we all need to consider when we're thinking about how we're going to manage our land, either land that we own or land that we're looking to purchase when it comes to exploring our homesteading or farming dreams. So come along and let me explain. So pristine tillable acreage is getting harder and harder to come by. And mostly it's because the price just keeps going up and up and up per acre. And it makes that land unreachable for most of us. So what we have to do if we're looking to buy a piece of land to homestead or farm on, then we got to start looking in areas that uh, aren't as expensive. Maybe these diamonds in a rough. So an issue I keep seeing when people find these diamonds in the rough is that they want to try to make it fit the cookie cutter idea they have in their mind of what they want their homestead or farm to be or what they've actually seen on YouTube. And unfortunately, that, that usually causes people to dump a lot of money into an area and get really, really frustrated in the process. A simple example of that would be like me saying, with this 100 acres, I want to do a lot of monocropping or row cropping. And that just wouldn't make any sense with all this topography change and with all the hardwoods. So I know what you may be thinking, well, Troy, that's kind of a no-brainer. But stick with me for a second, because I think maybe it's not as obvious when we look at some other details. So I recently did a land consult here in West Virginia where the client was looking at a new piece of land. He actually acquired the land and it had quite a bit of hay meadows on it. About five, about, well, actually about 10 to 15 acres of hay meadow. Now he wasn't interested in cutting hay. That was not part of his original homestead or farming goals. The hay was currently being cut by a neighbor who was coming over, cutting it, had permission to cut it, uh, and of course was cutting it and taking it and, and doing what he needed to with it. So it was just a fair trade. Hey, keep the hay meadows cut and you can have all the hay. But the problem with that situation is people that have access to free resources and don't have any ownership in the source of the resource, if that makes sense, uh, do what most people do, and that is cut corners. And this guy was literally doing that. He was cutting corners. So as he's mowing the hay meadow for hay, he's avoiding this forest edge that you'll see a lot here in, in West Virginia because that area usually grows up the brambles. It grows up the small saplings, kind of what we're standing here. He's a little oak tree growing here. Those type of things take over. And with hay equipment, getting into little saplings and brambles and autumn olives and those type of things, of course, damages or dulls the blades at least. So he was avoiding those areas. He was rounding off the corners, and in any areas, any problematic areas, he would just skip those. So those were starting to grow up, and it became a self-perpetuation type of thing. As the forest edge grew in more and more, then the hay meadows got smaller. He also wasn't doing anything to amend the soil or to put nutrients back into it after it had been cut each year. So the new landowner really had about five options the way I could see it. Number one, he could renegotiate the hay cutting deal with the neighbor and say, hey, you can still have this hay for free, but I need you to take care of these edges. I need you to amend the soil. I need you to start putting some investment back into this. To which the guy could just be like, yeah, it's not that big a deal. I'm, I'm just going to go cut somewhere else. I'm not that interested. So he has a chance of losing that guy. He could obviously go out and purchase his own hay equipment and start cutting that hay and trying to sell it or save it for his own livestock purposes. He could just get a tractor and a bush hog and then just mow all of that and even mow the edges, open those meadows back up more. But that, of course, would require a lot of diesel. He could obviously go out and invest in a lot of livestock and have that livestock rotationally graze that. Well, that's a big investment as well, and you have to know how to handle that much livestock. And lastly, of course, he could just let it return to natural hardwood forest, which would be a tragedy in my mind. So my client really has a dilemma in this situation. What is his best option? All of those, except the last, have a considerable financial um, investment associated with that and a learning curve, stress, all the things that go along with that. And I would say even option five has some stress associated with it. <laughs> that would kill me hay production just wasn't in his initial homesteading goals. So what is he to do? So I learned a lesson years ago when we bought this property right after we got the house built 
And in my mind, I wanted to have these pristine... Are you serious right now? Hang on, let me do some feeding so we can talk. Oh sure, now you don't make any noise. You're getting your bellies full. So where was I? Yes. So after we built the house, and I started to take more of an interest in farming, in my mind I pictured this hundred acres of hardwood forest being like what you see up in the eastern side of our state. You have this higher elevation mountains where they're all grassy and rolling, there's sheep, there's cattle, there's all those things. It's just clear open pasture. Kind of like what you see in The Sound of Music. So as soon as I had some extra dollars, I rented a dozer and I wanted to start that clearing process. And let me turn here 90 degrees. So this area about 20 years ago was all forested. And so we came in with a dozer, we knocked a bunch of trees down, we uprooted the stumps, and we piled them all up down here at the, at the bottom of this clearing where it got too steep to doze. And it took almost 20 years for those treetops and stumps and all of that stuff to decay and not be an eyesore. And that's when I quickly realized, wow, this is going to be expensive, A, with bringing the heavy equipment in, but B, there's going to be long-term consequences in trying to take this hardwood forest and strip it all away. And erosion, you know, that doesn't count the issues of erosion and, and some of those other things, but just the sheer labor and the byproduct or overburden from that work, what that's going to leave behind. Now you can say, well, wait a minute, Troy, why don't you just pay somebody to come in and clear cut this whole section and take every bit of lumber off? Well, I could do that, but even that, that leaves behind treetops, that leaves behind stumpage. They're not going to take everything, and it's going to look like a, a bomb went off, and I'm not going to be able to get in there very easily with equipment to get any of that cleared up. And not to mention just the amount of damage they're going to do with accessing all those areas to pull out every tree. So we decided at that point that it's time to just dance with who brought you. Instead of fighting the hardwood forest, we were going to embrace it. And over the years, we've been able to utilize so much of this forest to our benefit, as well as enhancing the forest in the process. So for example, for years I've burned wood to heat my house or my workshop or any other structures that we have. So of course there's just tons and tons of deadfall here that allow me to have that resource. I built a wood shop early in our time here so I could learn woodworking and be able to utilize these resources to make products not only for our house, but for other people. I invested in a sawmill to be able to harvest and manipulate that resource a lot easier instead of having to take it somewhere else. And that sawmill has allowed me to build structures on my farm, it's allowed me to utilize it in the workshop, it's allowed me to do all kinds of things um, with that mill. It was a really good investment. I acquired a wood chipper so I can take a lot of my treetops and chip those up instead of just leaving them in the forest. Chip those up for compost building up at the chickens or using it for a manure mitigation down in the, bar in the holding area for the pigs in the barn. Here recently, as you guys have seen on the channel, we built a lump coal crucible so I can take my hardwood cutoffs, any scraps or slabs from the mill, and be able to cook those down into charcoal using the softer woods or the less desirable woods to actually fuel the, the crucible and be able to make lump coal for the smoker and for other purposes. I've even donated firewood to friends who need it. And here recently we've started experimenting with biochar. There's even opportunities to take all that byproduct and turn it into revenue. So selling lumber off the sawmill, selling finished product out of the workshop or even selling firewood instead of donating it. So here's a perfect example. This is a piece of land that we've cleared, and I cleared it first with the trees before I brought in a piece of equipment to level off the land. But you can see here, even harvesting, here is a Virginia pine that we harvested for milling. I've yet to chip it up, but I, kept behind, I left behind this mockernut hickory. I didn't cut it down, because right now it's like I'm standing on marbles. There are... Hickory nuts too numerous for even all the deer to eat. So the pigs are going to be in here soon. 
So by embracing what I'm dealing with here, instead of always fighting it, then I've been able to not only save money and not having to buy lumber and firewood and all those type of things, but I'll be able to create money by selling some of the resources that come from that. And also a, a better peace of mind that I'm not taking on this huge giant of a task that I may never be able to see come to fruition in my lifetime. So my advice to you is to do the same with either the land you own or the land you're considering buying. Let the land tell you what is the best thing to start with. Let the land kind of help you decide what your initial goals are going to be with your homestead farm. So if you have a lot of grasslands, consider producing hay. Consider ruminant livestock. Consider all the benefits that acreage of mowable grass will provide for you and your homesteading goals. If you have a lot of trees, do like we did. If you have a lot of water, then look at utilizing that for various resources, uh, for livestock, for personal consumption, for larger population consumption, bottling water, or creating wetlands for wildlife habitat. So you may be wondering, so what advice did I give my client that I did the consult on that had the hay meadows that really didn't want to get into the hay business? Well, out of that list of everything that I presented, I told him he ought to do E, all of the above. Or would that be F? Anyway, all of the above. First, negotiate with the neighbor who's cutting hay already and say, hey, man, I'd like to continue this relationship, but would you mind taking care of these things? And if he walks, he walks. But work out a deal there. Maybe you have, there's some give and take that have to be done. Maybe you help cover the cost of the diesel or help cover the maintenance on the mower, whatever the case may be, to get him to take care of those things to open them back up. That will then give my client time to explore, okay, do I want to get into hay production? And maybe I can start acquiring this equipment little at a time. Or maybe I then want to also look at livestock on a homestead level to say, okay, maybe half of these meadows will leave for hay and the other half will raise ruminants and the hay that I produce over here will be able to feed the ruminants in the wintertime and they can graze and we can rotationally graze them so they're putting nutrient back in the ground. So if he's buying hay equipment, then he could also invest in a bush hog to be able to maintain those edges and clear those out himself and keep his hay meadows pristine or make them wider, whatever he wants to do. And some of those small little problematic meadows that's hardly even worth driving up to, my suggestion was to let those just return either to hardwood forest or mow them just once a year with the bush hog and create wildlife feed plots for the deer and other things. Every piece of land has its own unique identity. Don't try to pound it into some, some shape that you've seen on the internet or that you have in your mind. Embrace it and work with it, and it will help you not only reach your new goals, but it'll help you save time, it'll help you save money, and it'll reduce the stress, giving you a better peace of mind. Well, comment below and let me know what you guys think. Do you embrace it, or do you try to treat it as a blank canvas and start from scratch? Well, I pray everyone have a great week. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.